Oh, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with all of you this afternoon. Um, I have drawn uh, either the enviable or unenviable position of being the one to bring to close for two days, uh, uh, two full days of incredible presentations. But I invite you to just join with me in considering a question. And I was sharing with between presentations and sharing with Dave. Rather than putting a bunch of words up to um, share with you, I invite you to use your imaginations a little bit. And I want you to join with me in thinking about a question that has intrigued me for many years. What does it mean to be ecumenical? And more specifically, my research set out to explore the question of whether ecumenical engagement impacted our personal faith. I'll take a moment right now to state right up front some of my biases coming into this project. I tremendously value the past five years with attending AST to having the opportunity to share classes with uh, classmates from a variety of denominations, being able to share different viewpoints and different perspectives, um, to learn from one another and um, share from our different experiences. But I was somewhat skeptical as to what the impact that ecumenism has on our everyday faith, and particularly the faith within our congregational life. My question for grad project began percolating a while ago as an inquiry as to um, what in everyday terms is the significance of having ecumenical partners? What do we share and learn from one another? Um, but asking that question on a denominational level was a little beyond the scope of a grad project. So here we are. One of the responses I received when I began seeking out participants, um, or rather, something that I didn't expect when I posed this question around personal faith and ecumenism was the level of anxiety that it would trigger. When I put, first put out an inquiry and an invitation for participants, the, probably the very first response I got was an email uh, extending an invitation of whether I would be open to a conversation um, of a dissenting opinion as to why ecumenism is detrimental to congregational life. I haven't followed up on that conversation yet, and I, but I do hope to in the near future. I'm, I'm intrigued to um, hear that particular individual's take. But even beyond that anxiety, that question turned out to be far more complicated than I thought it might be. And in hindsight, that's probably part of why one of my advisors suggested that in going into interviews that I might want to set a working definition of what I meant by ecumenical. But what fun is that? So I had the thought, you know, if we were in chapel, I'd uh, take this opportunity, invite you to just take a minute to turn to a neighbor and talk for a minute or two about what ecumenical means to you, because I suspect you probably all have slightly different takes on the answer to that question. To make a really broad generalization, ecumenism uh, to some is the means by which different denominations engage in dialogue. Um, as Janet Gere writes, traditionally the church, ecumenical, uh, tradi traditionally in the church, ecumenical has come to refer to a collection or organization of Christian churches, as in the World Council of Churches, an ecumenical organization. But for others, ecumenism is a much more individual involvement. So which is it? Well, the short answer is it's all of the above and more. And But perhaps the question we need to consider at this point might be, what do we mean when we talk about church? And what does it mean for the church to be the body of Christ in the world? Returning to uh, United Church minister and educator Janet Gere, she offers this further description of ecumenism 
as stressing commitment to the well being of the household of God, by which we mean the whole world or universe. Well, I was fortunate enough going into the interviews holding a couple different takes on what ecumenism would mean. But as I said, in my interviews, I intentionally left that interpretation to my interviewees. And in doing so, I began to see how we operate out of different understandings, depending on our context, and that even as individuals, we're not always bound to the same understanding. Who did I talk to? I picked a variety of uh, ministers and lay people. Um, and in our conversations, we began to, in talking about ecumenism, we began to see three particular areas um, of work. The denominational, uh, denominational ecumenism, congregational ecumenism, where different congregations work together, and then an individual level. And I'd like to suggest that those understandings are strata um, of that larger phenomenon that is ecumenism. So as I delve into my stat uh, findings, I'll touch on those different strata at different points. But I thought oh, most of you spent the last two days looking at thought-provoking quotes and uh, significant points that maybe it was time for a change. And so I invite you to join me in the sandbox. I was wrestling with a metaphor that might help us to understand this question of the lived experience of ecumenism. And so I invite you to revisit a childhood locale, the sandbox. But this isn't your sandbox. This is an ecumenical sandbox. Now, in order to get to the question that I want to explore, we need to drill down a bit, down through this strata. Or since we're in a sandbox, if we get our shovels out, we'll start to dig and see what we come across. The first layer that we come to it is not the one that I want to explore, but it's, it's really important. It informs our views. Uh, each of us individually, and begins to shape our understanding. This is the denominational level. Um, and at this level, the boundaries are fairly clear. There are lines drawn out in the sandbox that you can play within your square, and I'll stay within mine, and maybe every now and then we'll kind of work together a little bit. An interesting phenomenon of this level of ecumenism is that if you go to look into the literature, you might easily become confused and begin to think that ecumenism is just another way of talking about Protestant Roman Catholic dialogue. That seems to predominate the literature of, uh, of this field. But there are so many other aspects to denominational ecumenism. We have different uh, recognitions. We have ecumenical partners um, and recognize different ministries one with another. But as I say, we want to go a little deeper than this. The trick now becomes as we be go deeper, the, strat the delineation between these strata becomes less clear. The, next, the levels we encounter of congregational involvement and individual involvement tend to blur. One informs the other. As one of my the participants I spoke with described, ecumenical engagement provided me the opportunity to see other churches and denominations not as monoliths but rather as organizations of other people and begin to be able to see other people as individuals, not purely, but based on their faith. This level also provides the opportunity to uh, um, an entry point for another group that often does not 
get into ecumenical engagement. Janet Greer speaks a little bit here about what the uh, label of ecumenism may refer to. And she writes that uh, ecumenism, ecumenism refers to those whose lived faith is expressed in care for the integrity of creation and who hold fast to the vision of the flourishing of all light, a world reflective of God's justice, peace, and reconciliation. And she goes on then to say that even though some ecumenicals may be involved in these communities, that is meaning churches, it is by virtue of their commitment to the whole inhabited earth, not their association with the coalition of churches, which gives them their name. One of the perhaps fastest growing groups within the religious spectrum um, is recognized in a number of studies, particularly uh, Thiessen, Wilkins, and Laflamme, are the nuns, those with no religious affiliation. That while they may not be affiliated with any particular religious organization, they're still called into that care for the world and that call for social justice. There are also points of engagement that at the congregational level, we begin to see kind of a series of different uh, areas that tend to make contact. Music was raised time and again, uh, outreach projects. And with, in speaking with ministers, in particular, ministerial and shared worship were points of contact. But I don't want to make this level sound purely uh, positive. There are challenges within the congregational level and the, um, the work of ecumenism at this level. How we live in the sandbox is not always in being the best of neighbors. I heard stories of reflecting on working with a, a colleague and how well that was working for them, but that in a previous charge, there really hadn't been very much uh, cooperation. But then in reflecting on the community, the entire community really didn't seem to have that sense of community and cooperation. I also heard again and again how ecumenism, sometimes it can become a stopgap uh, at the congregational level. Stories of uh, ecumenical efforts, uh, sharing and worship together, particularly in times when one church or another were short of staff. But then when situations changed and a church called a, a new minister, suddenly the decision was, well, we're not really so interested in being involved together any longer. How open are we to playing together in the sandbox, to offering, offering up our space, to sharing with one another? This congregational, congregational level is also the beginning of where individual engagement in ecumenism begins. Terms such as being invited or tapped on the shoulder, the participants talked about having been mentored into leadership in activities. And I was fortunate enough, one of my participants shared this phrase with me, that talked about having been encouraged to embrace uh, that sense of being called to the ministries of your life. That ministry is not just for those in the order of ministry, but that there is a strong calling to lay ministry as well. It's in that mentorship, in that invitation, 
that we're invited to think about not just what we're building up, but how what we are building is shaping us. The shift here, and I hope you can appreciate, is from that what to how. I want to tell you a couple of stories, and these are composite stories because themes came up again and again. The first came from in ministerial circles. And a reflection on how with ministerial groups, they often form along theological lines, but a, a discovery that um, and a naming that often some of the richest groups step beyond that and transcend and include the full spectrum of theological uh, community within that group. Within, within those groups, it was also named the challenge of trust, of taking time to build community. And also the importance of not when we establish an ecumenical group, not to expect that any one group should undertake all activities. One participant described ministerial that they, they were involved with meeting regularly to, for table fellowship time to gather at table, to share meals together, for conversation, and to practice, as they termed it, generous listening. And that at one point, uh, someone came to the group and said, you know, you, you folks are always doing these things together. Maybe you could organize this project. Sometimes ecumenism requires a more specific focus. And within a group such as this, through time and conversation and honesty, trust allows for hard conversations and the opportunity to grow. Also allows the opportunity to be vulnerable. Story that was shared as well, spoke of sharing different liturgical traditions and gathering over a meal and part of the Anglican de delegation arrived and we're talking about recent Ash Wednesday service. And a couple of Baptist ministers sitting at the table posed the question, well, what are you talking about? That's not part of our tradition. And what followed was an opportunity to share faith, theology, uh, practice, without any desire to try and convince or um, win over the other, but that there was an honest and open sharing and an opportunity of growth for all. Not unconnected to these ministerial groups came learnings from opportunities for ecumenical worship. And probably one of the greatest lessons was that if it, ecumenical worship is going to be good, it needs to be hard work. Heard the story of one community gathering to celebrate, to um, in sharing in the uh, week of prayer for Christian unity, and taking the liturgy that had been provided by the Canadian Council of Churches, and splitting that liturgy up amongst the churches. And following the worship, everyone kind of felt no one really felt represented by the worship, and so they made the decision afterwards that in in planning such worship, each group would have the autonomy to create worship that reflected their tradition and that in joining together, they would each honor what each and every group brought. And again, Ash Wednesday came up. Another story shared with me talked about how our different theologies and beliefs provide opportunities for us to consider new understandings or to consider our faith in new ways. Heard about in preparing for an Ash Wednesday, Wednesday service, 
part of the liturgy introduced uh, theology around sin that the person I was talking to felt somewhat uncomfortable, but they went and talked to their colleague and they had a deep theological conversation and were each able to come to an understanding. And the person that I spoke to recognized in hindsight that in having had that opportunity for conversation, they were able to see gaps in their own faith. As I spoke to the participants that were uh, kind enough to uh, speak with me, I heard a number of thoughts on how ecumenical activity had impacted their own personal lives. One shared that uh, they felt that uh, when we engage in ecumenical activities, we become more fully formed through our exposure to different points of view. And they went on saying that from their experience, they'd been open to the wideness of God's love and mercy and that that is what is more important than the difference in denomination or, or faith and understanding. And interestingly, I had one participant talk about that from as they were more and more involved in ecumenical activities, they found themselves becoming less and less denominational. That within their congregations, they were beginning to have critical conversations about how to be church. And what it means to be church. The question of welcome also came up. And a number of participants talked about how sometimes in ecumenical circles, it seems that those circles are even more open, open and welcoming than our own denominational ones. And in talking to another participant, they wondered whether perhaps those groups are more open because we come to them knowing that we don't hold the same beliefs. And so that forces us into conversation and knowing that we don't all believe the same things limits gatekeeping. So after talking to a number of individuals, reflecting and reading. I return to that question of whether humanism impacts personal faith. And I can't help but say yes. You might ask, will humanism impact my faith? Well, that's up to you. Is playing in the sandbox for you? Are you prepared to come and play and share in God's sandbox? Thank you. Jeff, thank you so much. That's great. Great applause. Good. Uh, again, let's just take a second, maybe 30 seconds or so, just to center ourselves, reflect on uh, the implications of Jeff's presentation and research and come up with some questions or thoughts. Good. Let's come back into this space. Great. Questions, comments, thoughts? Well, Jeff, let me begin with the obvious one. What happened to you? <laughs> As you did this research, how did it shift your, your worldview and your ecumenical view? <laughs> um. A significant piece of how it impacted for me was the importance of personal integrity. 
of being open in conversation with others to um, be willing to risk uh, and have conversation um, with others um, um, and being open to being changed through conversation. Um, Great, thanks. Other comments, questions, thoughts? Well, I can just comment that, um, you know, having, I was in a church where we did do ecumenical services for certain things. Um, and, and it was always a little uncomfortable because you just didn't, mm -hmm know what the other you know clergy might say and and then you didn't know if you had to field questions from your own congregational congregation people and and um so yeah it, it's a it, it it's an exercise um it's something that we do need to undertake because um because we are becoming not we're not becoming more ecumenical but but this sharing um there's a lot of of sharing of spaces a lot of sharing of uh services and intersecting that happens um i find nowadays and uh and it's an uncomfortable space sometimes to be in yeah yeah, you know, that that was certainly a piece that came from a number of the folks that I talked to around um, the importance of in in ecumenical groups of building trust, but then that that allowed the space to have really difficult conversations, and that um, that we need to honor that conflict is not necessarily bad, and that we can have um, be prepared to come away from a conversation. Um, not necessarily agreeing, but uh, that we have each been heard. I, I want to be a Zoom jerk and jump in, because um, uh, it kind of piggies back on what on what Diane just uh, alluded to. You mentioned that uh, there was less of a need to gatekeep. Uh, going into an ecumenical space. And, and I wanted you to talk a little bit about how your data supported that, because like Di, that's not been my experience. Um, so the conversations that I had that supported that, um, I, I, I think probably are, are, are probably bookend comments. Um, the experiences from the individuals that I spoke to reflected where, um, for instance, within United Church circles, sometimes there are, um, there's a presumed belief or theology um, within United Church circles and sometimes uh, to express something different than that can be quite difficult within a group. And what, what I heard from a couple of folks was that in going into ecumenical circles, there wasn't gatekeeping in terms of if you don't believe this, you're not welcome in. It was more of there was a mix in, in terms of um, we need to have conversation to figure out where we stand. We're not going to assume going into the conversation, um, coming into the conversation, I'm not going to assume that I know where you stand. Um, Was that groundwork explicitly set? That that understanding? That was that was experience that was shared from a couple of the folks that I um, talked with. Okay. Um, one. Uh, one in particular that um, one that worked within a quite diverse ministerial comp uh, 
context and um, identified as being more on the uh, um, evangelical wing of the United Church. So found sometimes that within United Church circles, um, there they encountered less acceptance than what they might even sometimes outside of the United Church. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Great. Uh, Linda, you're on. Linda. Thank you, Jeff, for this work. Um, I, I, uh, it, you're the second student today that's challenged us to do harder work <laughs> as, as people. So I, I was really struck as your, uh, uh, I can't remember exactly, I tr tried to write it down as you were speaking, but it, real humanism should be hard work, I think was the, was the quote. And as I was thinking about that, I, I was thinking it, it seems like it's, it's work. I, I'm just asking your uh, a question about this. It seems like it's internal work because because you have to be open to the other to be to in terms of changes but then also you have to work on how you understand because uh, you also said it takes integrity so you have to work on that so how you, you have to understand your own beliefs enough to be able to articulate it and practice it is that is that correct is that is that your experience or would you say that Martin? that that would very much so and just to take that a little bit further one of the pieces that was pointed out to me in a number of cases was there is even also much more of a challenge in engaging with other traditions at times because there's maybe different cultural assumptions um uh, dealing with misogynistic individuals came up a number of times um, in terms of ecumenical activities and um, the challenge of how do we deal with bad behavior and um, that um, being welcoming in an ecumenical circle um, we needed to be open to um, doing hard work together, but not necessarily that um, being nice was not necessarily helpful, that we needed to stand up and challenge one another when um, um, when we felt that uh, community standards were, were violated. Great, thank you. Sonia. Sonia Vandyhoo Fraser, AST summer distance student. Thank you, Jeff, for the research. And it, it has me asking a wondering question about, is there a difference in ecumenism when we look at the rural context versus the urban context? I'm thinking about that from my own experience. Uh, for those who are listening, I'm in a in a small town in southwestern Ontario. When I go to AST in the summer, I share with my Presbyterian and my Lutheran brothers and sisters, and we each take a month to host worship. When I came home last summer and got back in the pulpit in August, it felt like a huge family reunion. It was amazing. And I mean this respectfully because, of course, in this small community, many people are related on some level, cousins, sisters, brothers, going to different churches. And so it was a very friendly atmosphere in my experience. And so I'm just curious, it, did you in your research, if that was even a question, did you find any of that between rural urban? Um, not necessarily rural urban, but ab absolutely. Uh, ecumenism is extremely contextual. And even rural to rural, um, I just your comment about, you know, being kind of like a homecoming. Um, and I can share from my own uh, ministry context of uh, being in a United Church and having a Presbyterian church just down the street. And um, you know, we don't do anything together. Um, there seems to be kind of 100 year old bad blood between the two, um, which I find a great deal of irony because I know that my great great grandparents were members of that church. So, um, um, I, I think every every community, and I did touch on uh, one of the conversations I had um, with minister, was that in one of their uh, churches, 
there really was not a, an opportunity for uh, ecumenical activities because the community as a whole, the norm really did not uh, encourage interaction and everyone kind of kept to themselves. So that community in itself had its own context. So um, I think one of the challenges is that um, each one of us can do work on uh, being ecumenical where we are, but as soon as we move somewhere else, we need to be prepared to take a step back and um, redefine what ecumenism means in the, in our new location. Okay. Thanks, Anya. Pam. Uh, yes, I have the question. Uh, and I don't know if it came up in your in your conversations or not, but I'm curious about uh, if anyone engaged in uh, talking about uh, clergy who connected, got together in their own pockets, their own communities, where they got together, uh, did they describe the behavior of that group? Did they worship? Did they did they pray together? What did they talk about? Uh, the common stuff that's going on in the community. Did did any of those come uh, come up? And Linda, you're absolutely right. This does challenge us because there is so much we can be doing in communities. And what are we holding back from uh, is is certainly the challenge, Jeff, that you're helping us with. Yeah, um, had a, it was interesting talking to you because about half of my participants were uh, uh, ministry personnel. And probably every one of them had had slightly different experiences as to what ministerial could look like. Um, some had where the purpose of their ministerial was um, to get together, to uh, gather and share a table fellowship, that they would, um, you know, pray together, share kind of, um, you know, pastoral concerns. Um, but the focus was on building community and relationships within those around the table. And that was that was uh, the, the one where uh, it was quite explicit about that the feeling was that group needed to maintain that as being their focus and not try to take on additional tasks that um, sometimes in ecumenism, we need to have uh, you know different groups take on different tasks. And um, that spirituality and um, building community is one piece, um, but sometimes we need to create other groups that will be doing, um, maybe taking on different pieces of work in an ecumenical way. Um, so I think, I think the short answer is um, there, probably for just about every ministerial, there are some slight variations in that the ones that seem to work well from my hearing are ones that define uh, what the needs of that community are and how they can that group can support the individuals to go back to their communities and minister. Great. Pam, thanks. Any other questions? Thanks. Well, people are collecting their thoughts. Um, Jeff, what about crisis? I know you, you a second ago you alluded to context. My experience on occasion is that when there's a crisis in the community, suddenly those um, denominational barriers pale in comparison to the need to respond. Did you, in your in your work, see much of that? Like a crisis suddenly makes makes us ecumenical <laughs> in a new way. Um, I I didn't run into that specifically. I, I think the closest that came to that was. Um, one individual in particular just talking about the more and more that they did um, ecumenically that they saw their um, 
how they identify themselves as becoming less and less denominational and more ecumenical. Um, Janet Gere has is a beautiful description of the ecumenical as being uh, the individual who is simultaneously called to the gospel and into the world at the same time. Um, and uh, that got my thinking and I had some conversation with some individuals about that question of uh, in, in our identity, um, which comes first, uh, being ecumenical or being denominational and that that sometimes can become um, a, a stumbling block within ministerials or ecumenical groups when you have an individual that is um, fiercely denominational and um, um, so I guess in indirectly the I think crisis has the opportunity to bring out great things in community and within churches. Um, but much of, I think much groundwork needs to be laid ahead of time in terms of that there's relationship and trust and mutual respect that already exists. Great, that's really great. Thank you very, very, very much. Good, any, any other comments or questions? So again, I'm just gonna have one final question from, from me. And it, it goes really back to a question of kind of theopolitical positioning. So I've I've been accused by Christians of not being a Christian. People have said I've had pastors accuse me of not being a Christian because of my position on a variety of issues that would resonate with the United Church and many of our brothers and sisters in the Roman Catholic Church and other churches. So, you know, I've been pushed out of of, of Christian groups because I'm maybe a little too progressive or whatever, right? So how do we deal with that? I mean, there's a right left continuum. And I, I go and I go, look, I think I'm not sure I'd want to sit down and have a beer with you. Not that you ever have a beer with me, but you know, how do we deal with that? Um I think that it that is similar to um in some ways, some of the, the uh, norms that we place within our own communities, that um, safety needs to become a, a, a prime consideration. And um, one, of those, one of the stories that I, was shared with me was uh, an individual who, uh, a lay person who had done a great deal of work. And, um, you know, it was kind of one of their mentors uh, that they really deeply respected and then started to recognize extreme kind of some attitudes that they really could not accept. And there were attitudes towards women and comments that were being made and recognizing that as much uh, and attempted to challenge that, but recognize that sometimes, um, just as in our faith community, sometimes we need to draw a line with folks and say, no, I'm sorry, I do not feel safe interacting with you. And, and unfortunately, um, ecumenism is, um, as, as I tried to kind of, um, conclude with the idea of you'll get out of it what you're prepared to put into it or what you're willing to risk in putting into it. And um, those that look at it as a way of converting others, uh, that certainly is not a healthy attitude they're bringing towards. And um, unfortunately, I think there are those that um, we just are not able to um, interact with in a, in a healthy way. Yeah, and going back to the earlier comment about dusting the knocking the dust off our sandals, we're not yeah. welcome in that community. Well, yeah, thank you so much. I see Dave Sinis his hand up. Dave. 
All right, thanks. Yeah, I, I wonder, Jeff, if you could talk about how you saw power dynamics at play. Anytime we're talking about diversity um, among different groups, there are some groups that because of politics or sheer size might dominate a conversation. Um, how do you how did how did your participants kind of rub up against that or navigate those different power dynamics? Um, some of that was probably alleviated somewhat in that my my primary area of inquiry was looking at um, personal relationships and personal interactions. Um, but I'll offer one of the stories that was shared with me an individual that one of their ministries as a layperson was regularly taking a um, uh, labyrinth into a women's prim uh, prison facility and offering labyrinth walks. Um, and the, you know, as um, such different power dynamics for this person going in, at the same time, the level of respect that they demonstrated in talking about those women who were in that facility and that came to walk. Um, again, it comes down to um, individuals when they come to ecumenical activities uh, requires a certain level of um, personal uh, willingness to meet the other at, at the place where they are and uh, being open and vulnerable. 